And if you're taking notes perhaps tonight or you'd like a title for this message, it is very simple. It is Behold the Man, as that is what we will be seeing and prayerfully doing as well. And if you'll read with me, we're going to pick up in John chapter 19, verse 1. Where it says, So then Pilate took Jesus and he scourged him. And the soldiers, they twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. And then Pilate then went out again. And he said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And in verse 5, it says, Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. You pray with me? Father, we thank you again for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, as we have read in your word now, as we continue, I pray that you would just speak and you would help us to understand just all the more why, why today is so good. And Lord, why we can rejoice in a day that was dark. And Lord, thank you so much for the events that took place on it. Father, lead us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we are here tonight to reflect upon the events of Good Friday, which we call good for a good reason. We call it good for a good reason because the fact is that today our salvation was made a reality some 2,000 years ago as Jesus Christ gave himself willingly on the cross of Calvary. But really this day 2,000 years ago was not a good day for many. No, you had 11 men who had followed Jesus for three years, living with him and following him, learning from him. They shared so much life with him as he had called them to himself. But now nine of them had run away the night before as Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. One of them, who was the closest to him, had denied him as he was asked about his relationship and his association with him. He denied him not once, not twice, but three times. He said, I don't know the man. Really, only one of them at this time is left standing there uh, as Jesus is on the cross. And he's standing there amongst some of the women who were a part of Jesus' following, one of which was Jesus' own mother, who is standing there on this day watching her son die. There were also men, or a man rather, who had come with his family to Jerusalem. He had come with his family so as to uh, celebrate the Passover feast. As all Jewish males, they were called each year to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. He had come with his family expecting to worship, to sacrifice, to be there. And yet, here is this man is being led to uh, Golgotha. He is recruited by the soldiers leading him along, saying, hey, bear this man's cross because he can't carry it any longer. Basically, carry his instrument of his execution to where we will nail him to it. And for an entire nation, a people group, really, it was a bad day. It was a bad day because of so much upheaval, of turmoil, of disappointment, really, because they were expecting a revolution. They were expecting uh, this Messiah that they had perceived to be someone special to rise up and to lead them on a revolution against Rome. But yet, he hadn't. He hadn't done that. And in fact, many of them, they had turned on him, chanting for his crucifixion and setting of lauding him and being excited for his leadership. And for a Roman governor, it was a day of indecision. It was a day of doubts and ultimately a capitulation to the desires and the pleasures of an angry mob where he absolved himself eventually of all guilt, saying that, hey, I wash my hands of this. I wash my hands publicly. And he did so as he handed over an innocent man to be executed. This day over 2,000 years ago was a dark, bloody, pain-filled day for many. And yet we remember it tonight as good. We remember it tonight as good because, again, it was the day that Jesus Christ, our Savior, willingly gave of himself for the sins of the world. It is really on that day where what Romans 5.8 says comes into play. As we see there, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, on that day over 2,000 years ago, displayed God's great love for the whole world. As the world didn't deserve a Savior, the world didn't deserve reconciliation or the love of God, but yet Jesus displayed it as he there died for the sins of the world. But tonight as we reflect on this day, understand the verses we read at the beginning, they take us back to a point earlier than when Jesus was crucified. 
And as we look at a recap of the day, understand what we read here, we're picking up about mid to late morning. Mid to late morning on that day that Jesus is crucified, and already Jesus has had a, a, a tumultuous type of day. It has been quite a long, uh, really 12 to 16 hours for our Savior. In fact, the events leading up to this moment of John's gospel have been uh, quite scattered and extensive and really significant. You see, the night prior, Jesus and his disciples, they shared their Passover meal there in the upper room as they were together there. They shared their meal together, and it was in there that Jesus, if you've read there in the Gospel of John, that as they came in, he donned the garments of a servant, and he washed the disciples' feet, including Judas's feet, by the way. He also passed the bread to his disciples during supper, telling them that it represented his body that was broken for them. And then also the wine he passed as well, telling them that it was his blood that was shed for them, symbolizing there the work that was going to be happening and giving to us something that we are going to be remembering tonight as the church. Somewhere in the middle of that night, though, Judas left the group during supper. He went out to carry out the business for which he uh, knew he needed to do. He was going to betray the Savior, betray him there for 30 pieces of silver as he went to gather the religious leaders in the Roman cohort that would meet them in the garden and arrest Jesus. Also, Peter, again, the one that was closest to Jesus, who denied him here at the supper is when he learns of his going to, uh, of his soon to be denial of the Lord, where he would deny there that he would ever do so. But Jesus, of course, knew that he would. And then, of course, we see them going to the Garden of Gethsemane. They go there where Jesus prayed and he agonized over the events that were about to take place. And all of the gospels, they share this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke share really a, a description of that prayer. But Luke gives us insight into the agony that Jesus felt as he prayed. We're there in Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 44. It says there, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, then take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it says, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat, it says, became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground, knowing not only of the physical pain that awaited him and that he was going to endure, but also the separation that he would experience for the first time from his heavenly father as he took upon himself the sins of the world. Jesus' mind and his body, they there reacted to what was coming ahead as he prayed in the garden. And after that, we see, of course, G Judas in the cohort. They come into the garden there, and they come, and Judas betrays him with a kiss, identifying who he was. And uh, you know the story, I'm sure. The religious leaders, the Roman cohort there, they take Jesus, and they go and they begin the trial. And at this point, this trial is not legitimate at all. In fact, it's an illegal trial. They go to the house of Annas, that is Caiaphas, the high priest's dad. And they go to his house there, and throughout the entire evening, they there spend time seeking to pinpoint something on Jesus that would be able to give them grounds to kill him. And of course, there's nothing that happens. There's nothing that is there that he has ever done that could uh, pinpoint him as guilty. And so there's fabrication of stories. There's fabrications of stories and him, of course, breaking their traditions, but never the law. So they find him guilty and they have a desire at this point to execute him. However, there is an issue. There's an issue that under the Roman rule of Israel at that point in time, the Roman empire was in power at this time. And understand they had taken from the nation of Israel, they had taken from the Jews their ability to carry out capital punishments. And so they could have the trial, they could do whatever they wanted to do up until it was time to kill Jesus. And so what they had to do now was get the Romans to do it for them. What they had to do now was get the Romans to get on board with their mission to see Jesus done away with. And so early in the morning, after their illegal throughout the night trial, they transport Jesus from the house of the high priest now to the court of the Roman government, governor, whose name is Pontius Pilate. And there in Pilate's court is where we, is where we find ourselves in the story. And understand, as they bring Jesus to Pilate, he, he's honestly annoyed, and he's openly annoyed. He, he doesn't want to deal with this. He doesn't want to deal with this man from Galilee that's been doing so much. He doesn't want to deal with the religious leaders' issues that they have with him. He tells them to deal with it himself, since it's about their law. It's about their way of life. But they remind him that they have no ability to carry out an execution. 
And so Pilate, he concedes to question Jesus. He says, okay, I'll talk to the man. And he does. He talks to him over and over again. And time and time again, he finds no fault in him, as he wouldn't. Because there was no fault. There was none to be found because Jesus had never broken any laws. He had not broken the laws of God's people. He had not broken the laws of the land. He was sinless. He had never missed the mark once. And so Pilate tells the people in John 18, 38, he says there simply, I find no fault in him at all. But of course, they didn't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that, hey, this guy has done nothing. And so they continue to shout out, hey, we, we want him dead, Pilate. We want him to be done away with. And so Pilate in his mind is thinking, how, how, how can I get off the hook with this? How can I get rid of this Jesus guy and all of these? And so what he seeks to do next is to make a mark and a move of goodwill. As he seeks there now to free Jesus and not see an innocent man die, he seeks to set him free, claiming that, hey, at the Passover, at the feast, as an extension, a token of goodwill from Rome to the Jewish people, they would set free a prisoner. And he says, look, here's Jesus, the one that you love, the one that you've lauded, the one that you followed. Here he is. I'll set him free for you right now. But instead, they cry for someone else. Instead, they cry for Barabbas. Barabbas, who was this adversary, known adversary of Rome, and a revolutionary leader within Israel, one who had stirred up many things, and the people, they cried for him. And with his hands tied, really politically, Pilate releases him. Which leads us up to what we just read together beginning in John 19. A lot of events had come up to this point, but now Pilate, his hands are, are, are tied even still. And so what he decides to do is he decides to put some force into the situation. He decides to display force, and he decides here to take Jesus into the praetorium, where the Bible says that there he was scourged. Understand the praetorium there, the house and the courtyard of the Roman governor, that was a place where uh, many things would take place, and many things that would turn our stomachs would take place, and this is one of those events. Understand that Pilate thought that through the shedding of blood, the shedding of Jesus' blood, with the interrogation and torture methods at the hands of the Romans, that the people would be appeased. They would say, okay, that, that's enough. You know what? You, you gave him his licks. You can let him go. We'll be fine with that. And so Jesus is there stripped, stripped naked. He's there fastened to a post with his arms raised above his head. His feet probably would be just a few inches off of the ground. And then the soldiers take what is known as a cat of nine tails and they begin to whip Jesus. And this, understand, was a common practice. This wasn't something exclusive to Jesus. Now, this was a common practice for Roman prisoners who would, be, who would be interrogated in this method. The idea was that as they would take these cats of nine tails, this whip, the flagellum as it is called, at the end of it would be these bits of rock and bone, metal, anything that could cut or lacerate. And the idea was that as they would lay it upon the back of the would-be uh, criminal or whoever it was they were interrogating, and they would hit, and they would hit, and hopefully get some information that they would desire. The interrogation would come out uh, as success because someone doesn't want to get hit with that thing over and over and over again. And, and so they would, le they would loose, lighten up, excuse me, on the, on the blows as long as they talked. But if they didn't, they would hit all the harder. And of course, we know that Jesus... He had nothing to confess. We know that Jesus was sinless. He had nothing to confess. So what he did is he experienced the full force of the Roman guard. They're whipping at his back, tearing the flesh, more than likely down to the muscle, even further in to the bone. And once they were done with that, they released Jesus there from where he would be hanging. And they took there the crown of thorns, the word tells us, and they pressed that upon his head. And the thorns that we're talking about here are not like rose, rose plants, rose bush thorns or anything like that. The closest context that we have probably are the thorns that you see on a boat art tree here in East Texas, the big thick ones that hurt when you run into them. But these would have been easily six to seven inches long and it would have been wound tight and we aren't told it was just placed upon his head, but it was forced upon his head. It was pushed down upon his head, digging deep into his skull. And then after that, of course, we see that the purple robe was put on his back, which led the soldiers to mock Jesus as they tortured him, saying, verse 3 tells us, Hail, King of the Jews, as they struck him repeatedly with their hands. Jesus experienced this there in the praetorium, there in the court of Pilate. And then in verse 4, we have a shift again. We have a shift from Jesus and the soldiers now back to Pilate. 
And there the shift as it takes place, we see there that Pilate is hopeful at this point. He's hopeful now as he goes back out to the people still looking to release Jesus. What does he say? He says there, behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. He says, I've tortured him. We've interrogated him. We've done all this to him. And hey, I still find no fault in him. He needs to be let go. This is what Pilate's desire was, hoping that the ravaged and bloody body of Jesus would satisfy the crowd's desire for blood, for his blood being shed. And it says, Pilate lets him, brings him out. And there, verse 5 is so profound in what he says, because it says that when Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, that Pilate said to them, behold the man. He said, behold the man. And understand that as Pilate here presents Jesus, he presents here Jesus to the people, he presents to them the man. He presents to them a very special man. A man like there had never been before and a man like there will never be again because Jesus, understand, was a perfect man in every way. He was a man in whom no fault was found, in whom there was no spot or blemish. He was the only perfect sacrifice that was deemed worthy for all of humanity. And Pilate here, he presents him to the people. He presents him there, giving them the opportunity to see the perfect man before their eyes, standing there because of God's great love standing there because of the great love of God that sent him to the earth. He presents him there. And tonight for us, the Bible presents him to us. The Bible presents him to us that we all would behold the man as well as we reflect upon the events of Good Friday. Understand we are called to behold the man who lives sinless, but had each one of our sins applied to his innocent life. We are called to behold the man who deserved no punishment. But yet, because of God's great love, he willingly took upon himself the full wrath of God for the sins represented in this room and the sins represented in this world. We are called to behold the man and see God's radical love extended to the world, to you and to me, through the suffering of our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to behold the man, and we do well today, on Good Friday, to take this opportunity and behold the man. To behold him, to look on him and what he did for you, for me, for the whole of the world. Again, because of God's great love for the world. You see, when you and I, when all of the world deserve nothing but to stay separated from God because of our sin, we know from the word of God that God made a plan to send Jesus because he loved the whole world so greatly. That's the whole premise and the truth behind the familiar verses there in John chapter three, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, which praise the Lord for that, because that's what the world deserves. The world deserves condemnation. The world deserves the wrath that was poured out upon Jesus. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to this earth, not to condemn, but to save through the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. The cross and the event that we remember today, 2,000 years later, that still reminds us of the great love of God for this world, of God for for sinners, sinners like you, like me, like the world around us. Understand the cross on which our Savior hung, bled, and died upon. That is significant, and we do well to remember it today because that made a way for us to be with God. That made a way for us to have salvation, to be reconciled and have life with the Lord here and life eternal with him after we are done here on this earth. And we today remember that, and we realize, I pray, that it is that fact that makes Good Friday good. That makes this day so good. One of the best days in all of the history of the world. Today on Good Friday. And as we behold the man, we behold the Savior Jesus. And we together remember his sacrifice. His sacrifice that had to come before resurrection. Because without resurrection, there's no salvation. But you can't have resurrection without death. And so this had to happen. This had to take place so that salvation could be made available through the finished work of Jesus Christ, both his death and his resurrection. And so tonight as we are here on this Good Friday, 
And we have seen here this exhortation given by Pilate there to the crowd over 2,000 years ago. That same exhortation is still there for us today. And I ask you tonight, will you behold the man? Will you think upon and behold Jesus Christ and think upon who he is, that he is the Savior of the world, and that he desires to be your Savior and my Savior and the leader and the Lord of our life? And that is a possibility only because of what we read about here, only because he was willing to be taken, to be beaten, to be hung upon a cross. And there, despite all of the physical things that he endured, the worst of it all was the wrath that was poured upon him, the sins that he took upon himself, where for a moment there was a separation that he had never experienced between himself and his heavenly father. My friends, that is what makes Good Friday so good. And I pray that today we would be those that behold the man, that look to Jesus and to see the truth of that so that we could have hope, that we could realize a real and living true life as we look to him and receive by faith the salvation that he offers. My friends, that's what makes Good Friday so good. Though a dark day when it happened, it was one of the best things that could have happened because what it meant was rescue and salvation for all of the world. So I pray that tonight we will behold the man, and not just tonight, of course, but every day we would behold and see Jesus and know that Good Friday is good, that our lives are good, our lives have purpose because of what he did on the cross of Calvary for you, for me, and for all the world.